Hey everyone, this is Brian from the Tennis IQ Podcast. Josh and I hope that you're enjoying the content and discussions that we put out week after week. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us to continue to produce quality episodes, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash tennis IQ podcast slash membership. Currently, we have two tiers of support, $3 per month and $7 per month. So again, our Patreon page is patreon.com slash tennis IQ podcast slash membership. Thank you so much. And now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Brian Lomax. And I'm Josh Berger. And in today's episode, we are going to be recapping the 2023 Australian Open. And in particular, I think there's a few players that we want to talk about. Um, and some themes that we want to talk about. Uh, we, as as many of our listeners probably know, we talk about uh, the mental side of tennis, and uh, we we both utilize our sports psychology backgrounds in order to do that. And uh, for these Grand Slam episodes, we we do tend to talk a bit about uh, the matches and um, maybe certain matches in particular more, but also a lot about you know the the sports psychology themes and the themes about the mental side of the game that that emerged throughout the tournament. Um, so as a little bit of a recap, uh, on the women's side, uh, Arena Sabalenka uh, won her first uh, major, um, beating Elena Rybakina, uh, which was 4-6, uh, 6-3, 6-4. And on the men's side, um, Novak Djokovic beat Stefano Sissipas, 6-3, 7-6, 7-6. So I think as we start to dive in, um, it might make sense we could start a little bit with the champions, talk about them, and uh, and then from there, I, th- I know there's a lot of themes that, that we want to touch on in this episode. Sure. Yeah. And I think um, for me, maybe I'll even go to a theme that is shared amongst um, at least, well, I think all four of uh, the finalists, which is this idea of... Um, they're all on a journey in their careers toward becoming the best players they can be. Obviously, Novak is is further along, and his you know his motivation uh, for what he's doing is perhaps a little bit different. Also, you know he's at the at the top of the game, not only in the moment but also from a historical perspective. Now, with his twenty second major title tying the doll. With um, you know, at that at that total from the men's side, and um, but if I think about first, I think Sissipas and Sabalenka had some very similar comments with respect to their growth and where they are. Um, obviously, Sabalenka has taken the extra step now of winning her first major title, where Sissipas has appeared in two finals, but both of them referred to in some ways, the necessity of losing matches previously to help them get to where they are today. Um, And in fact, Sabalenka stated that she was glad that she lost some of these matches. And I think that that's a really good perspective, Josh, because when we lose matches, if we can be open to the lesson, be reflective, we can understand what needs work what needs to get better in order to play to to that level uh and in fact that reminds me of something that uh cc Paz said with respect to novak which is you know and this is i think a service that novak has been providing to many players but when you get your ass kicked like that yeah it doesn't feel pleasant in the moment but it really opens up your mind about where your game needs to go and uh you know, maybe to a certain extent, uh, Tommy Paul felt the same with with uh, Novak as, you know, and to Tommy's credit, you know, he went into the match with very specific goals and game plan, which showed that he had this belief that he could compete. Um, the difficulty was that Novak had answers for all of those things, whether it's Tommy trying to serve and volley, you know, play more drop shots or do other things. Novak was just too solid with the return, too solid with his depth too solid with his movement. And so that kind of experience, again, although unpleasant in the moment, 
really provides a lot of information about what it takes to climb up that the next rung on that ladder, right? I think that the ladder was one of those things, Josh, that you really liked from uh, David Samuel, and and you're right, and scaling that, and that's what a lot of this is: is the we're on this ladder. It has no top per se, but you know what do we need to learn in order to to take the next rung? And that's a lot of what I heard from C.C. Pass, Sabalenka, even Tommy Paul, uh, about where they are in their journey, right? They're earlier on in their careers than, than say, a Novak Djokovic. Um, I loved how C.C. Pass said that he believes that there's a champion within him and that that champion is blooming. So, um, you yeah, know, that, that along with what Sabalenka is thinking about herself, you know, it's allowing them to move on. I think that'll be another theme we'll talk about is really the self-image piece, but the fact that they are realizing a lot of their experiences are necessary to their growth. They're not looking at these losses, either in the past or in, or in this tournament with, with Pass, as sort of verification of like that they're just this level. And I think sometimes as, as fans, we see a performance and we might label or judge a player and say, well, that's just who they are. But these players are showing that that's not how they think. They're thinking more about growth and development and that all of these experiences are not saying that they're just this player. It's just a part of becoming the next version of themselves, right? And we, we talked about, we had a whole episode on the most important version of yourself being the player that you are becoming. And you're hearing these guys talk about that. With respect to Novak and his journey, you know, I thought it was interesting that he talked about how his career now is a lot about these big titles and that being the big motivation that's driving him. Um, obviously, staying healthy, you know, 35, he, he mentioned, you know, 35 is different than 25. But I think also he's appreciating what he's doing even more. Um, it's even more incredible what he's doing and, and how he overcame a lot in this particular event with the the injury that he had at the beginning of the tournament, as well as the, you know, the uncertainty of his reception in Australia after last year's episode um, where he was not allowed to, to, to play. So um, I think a lot of, you know, interesting stuff from, from them. And I guess on for Elena Ribikina, um, in terms of her journey, she seems to just be very focused on the process, the process and hard work and focus and, and trusting that results will come from that. And I think, uh, you know, her work over the last year has shown that that's a formula that is uh, you know, very functional for her. And I would expect that we'll, we'll see that continue. Totally, totally. Yeah, she, she's certainly made a lot of strides in her game. I mean, winning, winning Wimbledon um, and uh, yeah, certainly has a unique style. Um, I think particularly in terms of her emotions, right? Like doesn't, doesn't seem to let off a lot, either positive or negative um, seems to, to really keep it together. I mean, even while well, while well winning Wimbledon, you know, a, a pretty muted, calm response, all things considered. Um, but yeah, definitely someone who's worked a lot in her game. I know she talked about how, you know, she's, she's definitely an aggressive player. I mean, both of the, the women's finalists are, are quite aggressive and talked about how there's not really anyone that can really impose their, or, or not too many people that can impose their game on her, but Sabalenka was able to do that. Sabalenka, you know, I think had, has the firepower to hang with or maybe out hit uh, anybody on the women's tour. Um, but I think what's, what's held her back in the past is, is those, those ups and downs, those I think more emotional ups and downs that that she has, you know, had to deal with in the past. And you know, there's been matches where she's been unbelievable, and been matches where she has really struggled. Um, sometimes within the same match, oftentimes within the same match. Um, but I think you know she has clearly matured a lot. She's clearly made a lot of strides on the mental side of the game, um, and it's showed. And and uh, yeah, now her with her winning her first major title, I think you know it'll be it'll be very interesting to see can she build on that. You know, I think we've seen that from certain players, including Sviantek, who you know after winning that 
that first major title were able to to really grow and blossom as players and both in terms of their rankings and in terms of winning other titles. Um, so we'll see. I think, uh, you know, she, she definitely has all the tools. It's, I think it's always a matter of keeping it together mentally and bring, being able to bring out her best stuff. But, um, she's definitely a very exciting player to watch. And I think, I think also just the fact that she came back after losing that, that first set. And I think even in the beginning of the second set, um, it was she was serving, and I think it was love. Or no, fifteen forty in that first game, and managed to win that game again. You know, managed to win that second set, and then that third set. But I think it's interesting, especially as we look back. Sometimes there are these these turning points during matches, right? And um, I think oftentimes the beginning of a second set can can be one of those turning points that maybe not all players appreciate or realize in the moment. But I think as you look back at it the difference between losing a set and being down an early break in the second set compared to losing a first set and holding and then being able to put pressure on your opponent who's serving is is really a huge difference. And I, I think we, we also saw that uh, with the men where Djokovic um, was up two sets to love and went down an early break on Sissipas in, the, in that third set and managed to break him right back in that next game. So um, I think we see, we saw from both of those champions, they, they, they were able to really capitalize on certain moments that are, you know, I think I would think of as big moments, but maybe um, to some fans, you know, doesn't get appreciated in that same way, or maybe in the moment even doesn't get thought of as, that big of a moment you know it's it's at one love for instance in in a set um but you know as, as we look back at it it can it can be appreciated that 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 can really be the difference because momentum you know momentum can really shift in moments like that right if somebody's able to break or able to not break um their opponent can really start to turn that match around so um you know kudos to, to both of them and i think for for Tsitsipas, um, you know that this is now his second major final. That you know, he, so he's 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 lost both of them, but he's lost both both of them to Djokovic, and um, you know, certainly certainly tough. I think you know, within men's tennis, two of the toughest tasks are facing Novak at the Australian Open or facing Rafa at the French Open, and uh, you know, now now he's he's. Yeah, he's he's lost to to Novak twice. You know, the first time he was up two sets to love. This time, you know, definitely a competitive type match. I mean, I think he he's definitely has definitely made a lot of strides with his game. His backhand, I think, used to be more of a vulnerability. He seems to have improved it, and I think, you know, his, his self belief seems to have improved. He's he seems to now believe that he can, he deserves to be at the top. He can beat those top guys. I think he's. He's developed a, a lot when it comes to that self belief and sort of that self image of himself being a top player, being you know, being a world number one. Has you know talked about himself, um, you know, always sort of heading in that direction. Um, so I think it's yeah, I, th I think for him in particular, um, it'll it'll you know he's the type of person that can that can and I think will get to that that highest level and i think his self-belief is is a big piece of that yeah and i yeah I, I think that's important for him you know he sees himself as number one he sees himself as a champion and that gives him a self-image to play into so this is the danger i think is when not that we're hearing this from these players but just maybe even some of our listeners as they think of their own games think less about you know who you are right now maybe some of your limitations because that will just limit your potential that you can reach. It'll cap your cap that where, you know, all of these players are seeing themselves as developing into something bigger. Um, I think it will be interesting, you know, maybe we relate this back to Dominic team and his perhaps something he didn't do as well with his goal setting as he could because I think you know he often talked about he just wanted to win a Grand Slam and title, and then when he did, it seemed like the motivation, along with some injury issues, you know, bad timing perhaps, but it seemed like his motivation 
maybe changed or was different or not as strong. And um, let's say that CC Boss can become number one. Um, can he also look to be more than that? And I think that's something that Federer, Nadal, Djokovic have done very well. It was never necessarily about becoming number one. It was really about becoming the best they could be, or even the best in history, right? To be a more historical, significant player. And you hear that from greats in other sports, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Michael Phelps, um, how that thinking is different than, say, just a simple outcome like number one or winning a Grand Slam tournament, winning a major tournament. So it'll be interesting to see how he handles that because he certainly has the game to get to number one. I mean, he was this match away from achieving that. So, um, but he looks like he's on this great journey. And, um, yeah, I think the self-image helps with the journey. If you see yourself as a champion and you're playing into that, that, that can that can help. Um, you know, I also think just because he's lost his first two Grand Slam finals, there's, there's nothing to worry about there. Um, Yvonne Lendl lost his first four Grand Slam finals. So, you know, and then ended up winning, you know, several majors thereafter and also losing a bunch more. But, um, you know, we don't want to necessarily label CC Paz as somebody who's going to always be a runner up or anything. You know, these are just experiences just going to help him be even more successful uh, the next time that uh, he reaches this stage. Um, I think the thing about Sabalenka that she talked about with respect to self-image was in in some ways it seemed like she had this more self-deprecating attitude of like when she'd be approached for an autograph, like, well, why are you talking to me? I'm like a nobody or whatever. You know, and I think at the time she was probably like five in the world. And something that she learned was to develop more respect for herself. Um to realize that she worked very hard and that she is a good player. Uh, and I think it can, whether you're being self-deprecating or whether you're being overly critical, both of those also have limiting effects on what you can achieve and, and do with the sport. And now that she's opened herself up to the belief that she is a good player and she does work hard and how that can then translate into into better results um you know one of the differences that we saw josh like you said she could be very up and down and and she mentioned working on this um you know, she worked with a psychologist to try to help her with that and and now um from what she said she's not working with this person anymore but is really trying to hold herself more accountable which i think is great you know we all need to work on our own inner voices to the extent that they're helpful and productive and so forth. And you know, when you work with a psychology professional or a sports psychology professional, it doesn't have to be uh, forever. It oftentimes isn't. It is really more, can we help you in a moment um, of need to get to a, a better place to where you're now functioning and happy and, and, and maybe you can take the reins. And then if you need to check in again later, you do. So I think uh, her use of a psychologist in this case, it wasn't really referred to as a sports psychologist from anything that I read, Josh. So not that it needs to be, um, but that's obviously helped her to deal with some of these situations emotionally better than, than in the past. Because I think you see the reactions, they're different were different in this tournament than they might have been in past tournaments. Um, and so credit to her for working on that aspect of her game. Um, and credit to her for seeing herself in a different light that's allowing her to bloom into a better player. Totally, totally. And I think, you know, within that quote, and I saw I saw the same thing that, that she had said, um, I think it, it is really important that a player holds themselves accountable. You know, whether whether they're working with somebody, you know, a psychology professional, sports psychology professional or not, um, you know, that 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 missing piece of holding yourself accountable is is really key. Right. Recognizing in the moment when you're playing, uh, am I 
really trying to do everything that I can right now to be the best competitor and best player that I can be, whether that means how I handle my emotions, whether that means how I spend time in between points, whether that means, you know, the type of lifestyle that I'm living off the court in terms of, you know, my hydration, my nutrition, my sleep. Um, am I doing everything in my power? And can I hold myself accountable when I fall short? Right. Um, I think, I think that that's really key. And I think, you know, a sports psychology professional can, can certainly help with that process. Um, and I know, you know, she, she was working with somebody, um, and it, it sounds like it, it was helpful for her, but then she got to a certain point where, you know, she needed to hold herself accountable maybe more than she had been doing. And it sounded like maybe certain matches, um, you know, she maybe felt like, uh, she, she wasn't doing that as much or wasn't, you know, per, mentally per, performing in the way that, that she could have. And, you know, it was giving herself more of a break than, than, than she wanted to. Um, so I, I'm definitely very happy for her to have, you know, to have gotten to this, this point. I think it's a, it's a huge step for her. And I think, you know, it's, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see what, what happens. And, uh, you know, Brian, you, you brought up the point of, um, you know, Sissy Potts losing his first couple of Grand Slam finals. And I think there's other players we can point to as well who have, you know, lost their, their first, um, you know, Grand Slam finals. You know, a couple that, that come to mind are Andre Agassi, Andy Murray as well. Um, and I, I know it could be very emotional. You know, you start to think about, am I ever going to win one? Um, and that's tough, right? I mean, the just the way that, you know, there, there are only a few four Grand Slams throughout a season and they're spaced out. So, you know, the, it's it's easy to focus on that loss. And this, I think, is true of whether a player loses in the finals or loses in any other round. But I think it can be, obviously, there are other tournaments in between each of the majors, but I think it can be easy to focus on those losses. And I think, you know, players, club players who are, who are listening to this uh, can probably relate. Right, they're they're not playing in Grand Slam tournaments, sure, but uh, I think whether it's a tournament you played in, or whether it's a, a league match, or whether it's just a match against a friend uh, that that you played, but but it matters, it, it means a lot. I think you know lo- losses can linger, and it can be easy to it can be easy to hold on to those and and tough to forget about those losses. So I think it's it's really key to, um, you know, to to be able to look at people like Lendl and Murray and Agassi, you know, all, all on the men's side, who have had some of those tough chal- tough moments, tough challenges where they've they've lost, you know, certain, uh, you know, multiple uh, Grand Slam finals, but have come back to 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 win them and you know be top top players. Um, and I think, you know, and I know this is a concept that we've talked about, but it, it really can be seen as a necessary experience, right? You know, having gotten to that point where you are at the, the highest level of the game and you're in a Grand Slam final and you lose, and hopefully you can learn from it. Hopefully you can use that as a stepping stone. And I think that that can often be the difference, right? Where, where you, if you're able to really look at the match, look at what happens, and draw some conclusions from it and learn from it. I think that's one of the biggest differences. You know, that that process generally doesn't take place right after, you know, 30 minutes after a match when you're still in the heat of the moment and you're still generally emotional about whatever just happened. But, you know, maybe it's 24 hours later. Maybe it's a week later. Maybe it's a month later. But being able to, to look at the match, being able to really um, draw, you know, say, okay, what did I learn from this? What would I have done differently next time? Um, you know, how, what, what was the difference maker there? And can I take an honest look at the match and take an honest look at myself and decide how am I going to be different going forward? You know, what changes can I really make? And I think there's a lot of players that don't want to do that or aren't ready to do that because it's tough. It, it, it hurts to, you know, to really take that honest look at yourself after a loss because you can feel inferior. It can hurt your ego. Um, you know, it, it, you can start to think, okay, am I, am I ever going to win one of these matches? Am I always going to be losing to these top guys, um, or top players? Um, but I think it's a, it's a necessary step 
so that an experience like that can be really as valuable as it as it could be um and it can really be that that sort of you know ne necessary prerequisite ex experience that's needed to to get to the top level like i think most most players um don't just go straight up to number 1 without any sort of um turmoil or or any anything getting in their way i i would even think of djokovic and you know he won the australian open and then uh there was you know a few years where he was just sitting behind uh nadal and federer right he was could constantly number 3 for uh, for a long period of time for a, a few years um and then i think 2011 was really that year that he dominated and you know over since he's been you know with, with some some blips but he's been quite dominant since um especially you know in, in many of those periods of time so i think it, it often takes an experience like that and again this is a theme that we've talked about in, in many of our other episodes but that necessary experience of getting to that moment and maybe coming up just short to recognize you know just how how far you've come, yes, and also that you know what else do you need to to do to 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 get over that finish line to um to for for it to be a, a difference maker. And I think you know I, I'm sure it hurts. I'm sure it will take some time. But both um you know for for Rubakana and she she has already won a, a major. But um you know if she wants to to stay at the top and be a you know contender at at all Grand Slams coming coming up um again going forward as well as you know Tsitsipas now being a finalist now for the second time um i think a, a big piece of it is how how do you frame these situations um it, you know with really the goal of can i overcome these moments and then try to you know have a career like a Djokovic like a Serena like a Nadal or Federer um where you just see them at the top and they're they're clearly the person to beat and i think a big reason why they've become that person to beat is because of those earlier experiences in their career, that early, um, you know, fighting through adversity, fighting through challenges, fighting through adversity. And because of that, getting to the top and, and really earning their, their place there. And because of that, I think Sabalenka deserves a huge amount of credit for working on herself and understanding that something needed to change from an emotional perspective on the court. She wasn't generating the right kind of, emotions at critical times in order to to succeed. And I think that will be, you know, certainly a question for for CC bosses, you know, is there something on the mental emotional side that needs to, a little bit of a tweak in order for him to succeed? Obviously his game is getting better and so forth. Um but and he, you know, continue to follow the process, but can he take the, the long hard look at it and say, All right, what are what are some little things I can do? Maybe he's doing them. Maybe right. We we obviously are not part of the team, so we don't know. But that would be the thing I would look for from him in the remainder of the season. Is does it appear that he's processing things better? You know, the, I think the difficulty with him sometimes. I, I, it didn't seem like it was a, an issue this that much in this tournament, Josh. But there's always seemingly this tension with the box, and. Um, that is also something difficult to deal with that, that, that he has to um, address. And maybe they have, because um, that didn't really come up so much in this event. But let's see how the rest of the year unfolds for him. And um, But yeah, again, you know, huge credit to Sabalenka. And if we look at some of the other greats, like you mentioned Djokovic, he certainly improved mentally, emotionally from when he first appeared, say, 06, 07. Even through 08, you know, his loss to Nadal at the French Open in 08 was, uh, um, you know, kind of a beatdown. <laughs> so, I mean, I think it was it was maybe three, four sets, but still, he never looked like he was going to win, right? And um, yes, he was perennially number three. No, Rafa was perennially number two for a long time. We know about Federer having to deal with his temper and learning to calm down and, and learning that lesson. And that's really what led to his great career. So for these pros, you know, understanding that mental emotional state and where they, you know, what the optimal needs to be for them and can, do they have the courage to work on that and get there? 
I think is is, is very important. Um, another theme I thought we could bring up, Josh, was the one on expectations. And this has certainly been popularized by Iga Fiontek and um, how she approached that 2020 Roland Garros tournament with the idea of keeping your expectations low or having no expectations, but having high standards, um, using a, a bit of wisdom from Michaela Schifrin, the U.S. Uh, skier. And in a Instagram post that she put out after the tournament, there was a vague reference to this idea of uh, getting back to the no expectations thing. And perhaps that was a, a barrier for her because she is the number one player in the world and has won, um, you know, several Grand Slams now. And, and, and how do you process that, those expectations, that pressure and so forth? Um, and maybe she felt like, oh, I've got to reset and get back to get back to the grind and start to find the joy in things again and, and, and so forth. Um, so we have that on one side. And then on the other side. You know, someone we mentioned in a previous episode was uh, Ben Shelton. Went into the Australian Open with really no expectations, was completely able to enjoy the experience and play freely. And, and we saw that, play very, very well. Um, you know, I think his ranking, Josh, is going to move into the top 50 after this. He was 89 coming into the event. Um, and let's see how things change for him over the course of the year as he plays and um but you know he looks like he's an exciting player he's got a lot he's got a a big serve big forehand can you know the backhand is certainly good enough uh more than good enough to play um he has proven to be someone you know throughout his college and early pro career someone who who knows how to win matches how knows how to manage matches and so i'm excited to see what what he can what he can do, but it's interesting to see how one player felt no expectations, was able to play very freely, and another player perhaps felt expectations more than she would have liked, and and how that affected her. Not to take any credit away from uh, Ribikina, I thought Ribikina played an excellent match against Triantec, and and certainly deserved to win to win that one, right? Uh, but I thought I don't know if you have any thoughts on expectations, Josh. Yeah, so I, I, I have some thoughts on, on both Sviantek and Ben Shelton. Um, and I think, so to put it into context, expectations are natural, um, especially after we've had some better results, especially after we've won tournaments, we've seen how dominant Sviantek has been, right? Last year, um, you know, she, she became number one in the world in sort of an unusual way, um, where she was... She was number two, and Ash Barty who was number one at the time. Retired, and I think, you know, that was certainly an unusual start to becoming number one. But she she really took that on with the the best possible attitude, and you know, w- was just a, a very dominant, very successful player last year. Went on a very long winning streak, um, and you know, seemed to to really play great throughout throughout last season. Um, but at the same time, when we have great results, when we're world number one, when a player wins grand slams, when a player goes on a really long winning streak like that, it can very easily lead to expectations. And you're the favorite in every match that you play. And that can lead to pressure. And I, I, I'm glad that you brought up the instig- Instagram post that, that, she, that, that she posted. I'm actually gonna uh, read it so it's here's what she posted she said back home accept adjust move on thank you australian open and thanks to all of you for your support not the result i wanted but i will keep learning and keep working hard with no expectations see you soon p.s it never gets easier you just get better so i think there's two maybe three important pieces there I think the the piece of accept, adjust, move on is really key. Um, something that all tennis players could could learn from, right? That you know, after a tough loss, after a tough tournament, when things aren't going well, 
can you accept that, right? There's nothing you can do about it. It's out of your control. It's in the past. Can you get to a, that point of acceptance of what has happened? But that second piece, adjust. Can you adjust and make the changes, whether these are uh, changes in your game in terms of your strategy or game plan, whether these are mental changes, whether they're maybe strength and conditioning changes, whatever it is, can you make those adjustments and then get to that point of moving on where you're not holding on to it? Um, so I think that that piece is important. And then, and then, yeah, we, we, where she talks about, you know, not the result I wanted, but I will keep learning and keep working hard with no expectations. And yeah, she, she did talk about that, you know, when, 2020, 2021, 2022. And I think that was a big reason for her rise to the the top of the ranking to, to winning that, you know, that first French open title um, and, um, and to really rising up the rankings. So um, yeah, I, th I think that will be key for her as she, you know, moves on past this loss. Uh, but I think, I think it's definitely something that, that everybody can learn from. Um, and I think Ben Shelton on the other side, you know, Rather than being ranked number one in the world, like like Shviantek was ranked, as you said, you know, outside of the top fifty, I think, yeah, eighty nine. Um, and not only that, a year ago was ranked outside of the top five hundred in the world. And he was, you know, he's had a lot of success. He was um, the I think twenty twenty two uh, NCAA singles champion. So at a college tennis level, has had a, a lot of success, a lot of big wins. Also comes from you know, a, a family of, of tennis where his, his dad was a, a top player. Um, but he really seemed to approach this tournament with a lot of freedom, felt like he could play loose and felt free. And he was, seemed to really be enjoying himself and smiling a lot out there. And I think all of those qualities really helped him produce some of his best tennis and play in a way where, he was loose and he was relaxed and he wasn't wor he didn't come in with such expectations and he wasn't worrying so much about results. He was more so just playing. And I think for a lot of tennis players, that's actually when they can, you know, everyone's different. Sure. But I think for a lot of tennis players, that is when that gives you a better chance to bring out your best game and your best stuff. And it gets tough. You know, I think it can be tougher to do that. Right. You know, the next time he plays in a tournament, he'll have more of a target on his back, right? He, you get to a Grand Slam quarterfinals and, you know, people, rather than just being a player that's ranked 89 in the world, um, you know, every, everybody knows that this guy can really play. So you have a target on your back. You might be the favorite going into a match. And that, lead, that, that can lead to pressure and expectations. So I think the, the question or the challenge is, okay, after this, um, you know, how can you manage that? How can you continue to try to play with that freedom, play loose, you know, not be thinking too much about the results late going into matches and while you're out there, right? I think that's when I, when I talk with tennis players, I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges, trying to get results out of your head leading up to matches and actually in the match itself, right? If you're, if you're at, if you're in a tiebreaker and you start thinking about, winning the tiebreaker, start thinking about, okay, how is this going to impact my ranking and my UTR rating and all of these things instead of, okay, what do I have to do this point? Then, you know, one of those two ways tends to put a lot of pressure on somebody. One of those two ways directly helps you win that next point because you're focused on how you're going to do it. So I think, I think that's definitely an important theme here that, um, you know, that how, how can we not let, expectations get in our way of playing our best and can we put those aside and and focus more on our standards and you know what are those controllable things that we want to focus on whether that's our effort our attitude our strategy our intensity um you know our strength and conditioning whatever that is but can we really focus on having high standards for ourselves and with with hopefully the the outcome being that we can play in that loose, free, relaxed way where we're more likely to bring out our best tennis. Yeah, and like you said, we'll see if um, you know how how Ben does with that challenge as he gets better, and you know people will be looking for him more so than perhaps they have been. Um, and that'll be part of his journey. You know, just even if he is a little less successful with that this year, doesn't mean he will always be less successful 
with that, you know, and I would, uh, I would look for him to be somebody who probably will figure it out and, and handle it well, because he's, he also has the physical weapons that could be very, could be very dangerous. So, um, overall, I thought it was a, you know, a really interesting couple of weeks to watch, uh, the tournament and, and get engaged with, uh, the different, the different storylines, um. You know, those were the for me again, Josh. Those were the major themes in terms of um, what I saw: the the expectations piece, the journey, uh, the self image, um, and really working on yourself through this process and making it a process of growth and and development. And then we're seeing all of these pros um, go through that, and it's really exciting because it's we can learn from that as well in our own games. It's, um, there's always something for us to go out and work on. You know, we've, we've discussed this tennis thing from a existential perspective many times, like this tennis project of ours is, you know, it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing. It's just, it brings hopefully some joy and meaning and fulfillment to, to your life. And you know, how, how seriously, you as the listener takes it versus the, the pro is, is probably different, maybe not, but um, can you just keep looking at it as a process of growth and um, helping you to develop your own character, develop yourself as a person, etc. You know, even Djokovic mentioned the idea of tennis, uh, helping him to develop his character throughout the years, and certainly we've seen that, that growth, and none of us are perfect. Um, one of my favorite quotes about when we think of people, like maybe we think, oh, so-and-so is so mentally tough or they're so this or that. And no one is really mentally tough 100% of the time. We simply have moments of mental toughness, you know, or moments of enlightenment or moments of confidence or moments of courage. And the whole idea is, can we try to develop more and more of those moments in our lives and not be harshly judging ourselves for when we inevitably don't reach the standard. Instead, use some of that as an opportunity to learn from what I need to do better, but also look at the moments where you did reach your standard and how did I do that? How did I, can I celebrate the fact that I did that so I can continue that? Um, To me, that's a little bit off the tournament piece, but I think it's also what we're seeing from these players is that, there will always be moments of vulnerability and fallibility, um, and those are not the defining things. Um, it's constantly a battle to just be have more and more good moments, more moments, like I said, of mental toughness, enlightenment, courage, confidence. And uh, that's why I really like watching these, these tournaments is to see people grow into that. Totally, totally. And I think... Both of the champions are prime examples, right? We we think about Sabalenka and, and really the growth that she's had getting to this point and sort of overcoming uh, past matches where maybe she's been in more of a winning position and struggled. And Djokovic as well, who's certainly had his ups and downs. And I think in in this, you know, plenty of ups, obviously, getting, you know, winning now his, his 22nd uh major title and, and regaining world number one and certainly very impressive there. Um, but has had to find sources of motivation and definitely seemed to be a man on a mission this tournament and uh, seemed to also, you know, learn from uh, maybe past experiences where, you know, as, as we talked about earlier, you know, it hasn't always been a, a smooth journey to the top for him, right. Where he was, he was at, you know, number three behind, those those two other greats of Nadal and Federer for a number of years and um, yeah has had um, has I think improved his game each step of the way and I think one other thing you know Brian and I both are uh, based in the U S and you know good to see some some American faces uh, who who had some some great results uh, I think um, you know we've seen a lot of American women who have been at the top of the game so I think nice to see in this tournament some some U.S. men also getting, you know, getting to the top of the uh, game, you know, in terms of Tommy Paul reaching the semifinals, three U.S. men reaching the quarterfinals, um, some of the top players in the world, including 
Nadal, Kasper Ruud, and Medvedev all losing to American players as well. So I think, um, you know, definitely the still still just a start, and but definitely maybe the the um, the beginning of uh, some some of these you know U.S. players um, improving their rankings, getting getting closer to the top of the game. And I think it's also interesting. You know, it seems to be sort of a community of them kind of pushing each other and, you know, getting to the top of the game together, beating these top players, maybe, you know, maybe we had talked about expectations and we talked about self image. And I think when one player can produce an upset like that, it can lead to other players doing it. We saw Tiafo beating Nadal and reaching the semifinals at the U S open last year. Now Tommy Paul doing it. I think that, you know, self-belief can come from ourselves and what we're capable of doing, but it can also come from um, some of the people around you and that community that you build. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's an example there. And it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if they can, they can build on this success going forward. And I think it'll be interesting to see if they can, they can truly train as a community as they continue to get better and better, because I think tennis tends to be a very singular insular sport and um, that model is not often used in, in, in terms of training, even though it could, in theory, really produce a lot of good benefits for the players. Um, you know, maybe this could be part of our discussion when we look at the Netflix special Breakpoint, but it's a lonely sport. Um, other sports, more maybe Olympic sports, have taken now to putting individual athletes into training groups and having them train with each other and make each other better, pushing each other, as you said. It'll be interesting to see if this group, how much uh, that'll get adopted and if they can keep that up and, and, and how it really works for them. Because I don't think we've really seen that so much. Maybe with the Swedes in the 80s, because uh, there was a big group of them, and I think that they did a bit of this, but um, I think it could be an interesting approach, and we'll, we'll see how the rest of the year goes. You know, it's a good good showing for them, but the proof will be in the consistency, as in everything, right? And we, we've seen plenty of players in the past who have a spectacular couple of weeks, and then, then they're nowhere to be found afterwards, right? So... Um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're an American tennis fan, it's it's, it's good stuff, um, and you know, could provide some new faces. So I think it's uh, we'll see what happens. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, definitely. Um, some matches, some players to be uh, excited about. You know, Mackenzie McDonald, Jensen Brooksby, um, getting getting a couple big wins um, as well. You know, and and you know, and, and just seeing Tommy Paul get to the top of the game and, you know, Sebastian Corda beating Medvedev in straight sets. So I think, you know, definitely some big wins, but as you're saying, Brian, you know, I think the consistency will be key, will be sort of the, 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 what, what it all depends on, right. It's, it's, it's one thing to, to have, have a great tournament. It's another thing to let that tournament be sort of that necessary experience that catapults you to being a consistent top player. And I think Tommy Paul also talked about that after that loss to Djokovic, just that, you know, Djokovic, you know, beat him pretty, pretty handedly. I know the first set was close. It was seven, five, but the second, second and third sets were, I think, you know, one of the sets he won, one of the sets he lost six, two, one of the sets he lost six, one. And I think, you know, it, he, he talked about how that showed the vulnerability the vulnerabilities in his game or just how far he has to go still to, to beat a player like that. And just that Djokovic made him feel, you know, inf- inferior and, and really maybe showed some of the areas of his game that, that aren't up to Djokovic's level and talked about trying different things, wanting to try the, he had a plan, right? He had a plan going into the match. He wanted to try the servant volley. He wanted to try the drop shot. And he talked about how, in his press conference afterwards, after that semifinal match, how he tried certain things and none of it was really working against Djokovic, which is a tough spot to be in when you're trying different things and nothing's working and you just seem to be coming up short because you're facing a a better player. But the question is, can you use an experience like that and learn from it and, and say, okay, this person beat me. What 
what about my game was vulnerable? What were the reasons why they were able this why Djokovic was able to dominate me and, and really take control of the match like that? And I think that's the type of attitude that that helps um taking a an experience like this and really letting it be a, a stepping stone to that that consistency that you're talking about and being that, you know, consistent top player. For sure. Yeah. So again, another another great major for us to uh, dissect and, and talk about. So um, thank you all for listening. If you have any feedback or questions, you can email Josh and I at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. You can also use the Twitter hashtag tennisiq. Additionally, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, including YouTube, so you can be notified of new episodes. You can also check us out on Instagram. If you would like to support the podcast, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash tennisiq slash membership. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon in our next episode.